Welcome everybody to UFO Man Live. My name is Tim or UFO Man and my co-host for this evening is the beautiful Rhiannon Alley. Please welcome Rhiannon to the panel. She is broadcasting from uh, Costa Rica, so bear with her please. Uh, we do have a little bit of a sound issue, but we'll work through it. Um, our guest tonight is the esteemed Ron James. He is the director, producer, and all around good guy who um, made the film Accidental Truth, UFO Revelations. It was released in March and it is one of the best UFO documentaries out there right now. So if you get a chance, uh, go out there and rent it. It is on Amazon Prime and multiple platforms. Uh, please do rent it and watch it. You may have to watch it several times because I get new information every time I watch it. So check it out. Uh, welcome, Ron. Thanks for having me on. Um, actually, the film didn't come out till April 18th, so it just passed its one-month anniversary. And um, it's been in the top 10 documentaries worldwide for its first month. So thank you to everybody, and, and I hope that people are, are enjoying it because it, it means a lot to me that it's getting out there. Yes, um, it is a very good film, and it's very factual, and that's what we like about it, at least myself. Um, Rhiannon, uh, you, can you uh, let us know what you think about the film? What do you think? Well, I love that it was truth-based, and everything was completely clarified and backed up. Can you hear me, guys? Yes. Everything was validated. I mean, and I bought it. I didn't rent it. I said, no, I'm going to buy this and I'm going to show my friends and family the ones that are kind of on the fence about this stuff, you know, because it's not you like me or Tim just talking about it, about this movie that we saw. We are going to play it for them. But no, I, I'm so glad that I bought it and it was very well done. I mean, you, I don't think you can get any better than that. Disclosure. Okay, I do have a question for you, Ron. I, I wanted sure. you to let us let our viewers know a little bit about yourself and how you got involved in the first place with the idea of creating accidental truth and um, doing all the in-depth research that um, was required to uh, put it out. Yeah, um, I've always been kind of a fan of the UFO field, and I was hired. I, I, I own a production company doing music videos and productions and stuff, and I was hired in 2007 uh, to do the X conference live stream. And it was then that I started getting close to some of the people in the UFO field, people I've watched on TV growing up as a kid, Stanton Friedman, Nick Pope, guys like that. But, you know, I realized that we're dealing with the largest deception ever perpetrated on humanity. Um, that people might debate that, but but that's how I feel about it. And so early on, I decided that I was going to stick around and try to do something about it. And so I, I've made, in 2012, I made the Disclosure Dialogues, which won whatever awards were available back at the time. It won the EBE Award, the little alien with a movie camera. Uh, and it, uh, it was the first film. It was a five DVD set with a master movie about the process of disclosure. And then uh, I've I started MUFON television in that period of time. So I've created the world's largest uh, repository of credible UFO material with no commercials. Um, so that, that's something. And then I did a lot of episodes, my own shows. And finally, I got around to, to wanting to make another film. Uh, but I didn't want to make one until I felt I could really move the ball. There's so many films that come out and it's just like, okay, it's a bunch of wild speculation, um, people telling stories, but what can we actually prove and, and what what can we make a good case for and so accidental truth is is that it's got everybody you know like when i wanted to cover what happened with the new york times story about the, the tic tac ufos that broke in 2017 well i went and i got ralph blumenthal to talk to us about the inside story of that of, of that and he's the guy who wrote it and then when we uh when we're talking about the scientific aspects of some of these technologies that are supposedly in our possession. Well, let's go get Michio Kaku. He's arguably one of the biggest scientists on the planet. So let's see what he thinks about traversable wormholes and all the different types of things that, that, that we talk about in the film. So I, I, I managed to get a really an all-star cast of people. We got Congressman Tim Burchett uh, sitting in his office. I interviewed him there talking very candidly about how he feels about the UFO cover-up. 
So I'm super stoked about the film. It's, it's all about, you know, just the facts, man. And it, it's, it's good for people that are really into the topic because I promise I've heard people out there say, Oh, there's nothing in there. We don't already know. I, I can't believe that because there's a lot of really nice, um, Easter eggs for people that are hardcore UFO fans. And then there's, if you've never paid much attention to the topic, maybe watched an episode of ancient aliens or something, this film will bring you up to speed on, on what this is going all the way back to Roswell. I hated to do a history lesson, but I, I did a little one because I had to, to make the film self-contained. But once you get past that, it's a onslaught of just mind blowing facts. I was going to say in regards to Tim Burchett, um, he is very um, in your face about how he feels about everybody in the public getting kind of hosed mm -hmm. by the uh, UFO hearings and the uh, uh, unclassified reports that we quote unquote have supposedly seen, which were mostly redacted. Right. Um, so it's kind of like uh, we haven't seen anything, really. And the last UAP hearing was kind of... Oh, that was even worse than the first one. Yeah, the Mosul Orb. What's that? I mean, they didn't really show what it was. It just flew through the screen. I mean, it was better than the one that they showed in the first one, the first UAP hearing, where you didn't even see it. But it's still kind of a joke, yeah. Uh, see, so, all of this is just showing us how compartmentalized it's been. And people right. throw those phrases around, but it's really true. You know, in the first hearing when Multi, Multi and Bray were like, oh, that's not within the purvey of the UAP task force. It's like, give me a break. It's plausible deniability. And all they've done since 2017 is keep inventing new, new programs that are supposed to get to the bottom of this, giving them a fancy acronym that nobody can remember. And then none of them have any information. You know, that poor guy at the last at the last hearing, um, clearly he's either the best liar on the planet or he's not read into much of anything. They've parked him yeah. off in a corner office and thrown him a bunch of pictures from the military and said, this is it. And we're like, well, that's what? <laughs> yeah, Dr. Kirkpatrick. Yeah, I, yeah. I, I felt I felt that he was under the gun during that uh, hearing and he did a pretty good job of uh, faking his way through it. But in my opinion, he he didn't have any information, just like you said, um, except the continuing narrative, which happens to be the new narrative uh, yeah. from what you said. Um, the new narrative that we know they're here, we know they exist, they're real, but they may be a current and present danger to our national security, blah, blah, blah. It's almost like Project Sign. Yeah. Well, you know, as we point out in the film, this is almost a verbatim uh, quote from General Sanford in the 1950s, who came on and said the same exact stuff. It's like they're 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 trying to whitewash the past, but they're doing this in such a way they they could have at least hired another screenwriter to rewrite the script. It's it's almost and and you know in the film we compare them. Okay, here's General Sanford in the 50s. Here's uh, here's Bray and Moultrie now. Here's Will Elizondo now, and here's General Sanford in the 50s. And it's like wow, you know, it's like uh, these guys are saying the exact same thing. And and uh, you know the general public will never understand that, but hopefully this film helps them to understand that. That's that's what it's about. Rhiannon, it's like stick to the script. Like stick to the script, and the, and yeah. that's exactly what they're doing. The new narrative is basically nothing's been studied by the government since Roswell and, until the beginning of the Robert Bigelow program. Nothing. There's been no interest in UFOs. Uh, what we're seeing now is not ours that we know of, and we we are committed to getting to the bottom of the of the question and finding out what's going on. But they said that 75 years ago, and so it's like you'd think. If they were doing it 75 years ago and they were committed to it, then then what's <laughs> what have they found? Yeah, um, what, so, what, yeah what's holding them back? Pony show and buried no. in well, and again, that. Oh, go ahead. I think that, um, it, and I said this before, you know, everybody's waiting for the government just to come out and say, yeah, there's little green men. Yeah, we know this. And yeah, you know, we've been communicating with them or just dropping the bomb. 
on the public like that. And it's just not going to happen. We, the people are disclosure. Your movie is part of that disclosure. And that's what's fantastic is we're having to take control of our narrative. That's the truth, truth based. Right. It's, I'm, I'm it's, very proud of this film because, it, you know, it does exactly that. There, I'm constantly asked by people because I do a lot of these kind of interviews and then with Mufon, my role there, um, that, you know, I'm their, their press interface. So I'm always asked, you know, what is one book I could read or one film I could watch that would lay this out for me if I'm not an expert? And, you know, I, I never could really say that there was a definitive film that could take a novice in the topic and give them enough information for them to understand, well, wait a minute, there's really something here. And that's what I've done with Accidental Truth, or at least that's what I tried to do. And I think I succeeded. Um, people are saying I did. But uh, yeah, this is the film you could watch that, that will bring you up to speed on what this is all about. If you're an expert in the topic, you're going to find cool stuff that you didn't know. And if you're not an expert in the topic, but you're curious, watch this film. It'll save you a whole lot of time. And, you know, so many of the of the UFO films that come out are, you know, 10% truth, 50% conjecture and, and, and opinion. And they just wild stories that we really can't prove or make a case for. And accidental truth doesn't take that route. It's, there's a strong case for everything. Okay. One thing I was going to say is um, I heard that you had a lot of difficulty in bringing the film to fruition due to a lot of surveilling or, uh, people uh, checking out your film before it was released. Can you go into that? The film was released on April 18th. And I can tell you that until midnight on April 17th of 2023, when I saw that icon appear on Amazon, I still was not convinced it was ever going to see the light of day. The, um, the, the process of making it, I mean, obviously I'm, <laughs> I'm having these phone calls and I'm like, oh yeah, we're really going to get the defense intelligence agency on this one. You know, and I learned that you can't really have those kind of conversations without attracting attention. So, so yeah, there was a certain amount of that. I would wake up in the middle of the night sometimes because my, my computer room was making noise and my, my hard drive is just chattering away. And I can look at the, the, where you measure data being transmitted and somebody's scraping my hard drive and, and, and it's not being done by hackers. It was being done by somebody that was keeping an eye on the process of the movie. And, um, yeah, there was, a internally with the, with the film distributor, people threatened them, uh, people threatened me. Uh, it, it, about using specific information in the film. It's like, if that goes in there, then we're going to sue you. And, and then the distributor's like, well, somebody threatens to sue us. We can't, we can't release the film. And it was like that for, uh, for a long time. And, um, you know, I, I, there were times when I was getting really scared. Uh, when it, like I'd come home and it was clear that somebody had been in my house, you know, like somebody will take something that belongs to one place and they'll just put it somewhere else. And that's how they let you know. Mm -hmm. And, and that happened. And it's just that's like, scary. I know. And, and I don't want to sound like one of those, you know, sounding the alarm at weird conspiracy theory stuff. So so I, I don't want to do that. But uh, when you watch Accidental Truth, you you will realize that we we caught a lot of people saying things they didn't mean to say. And we put it in the film and we uh, we're, we're not pulling any punches. Um, nobody gets called a liar in this film. Nobody gets denigrated. It, you know, I'm not out to get anybody. There's no angry tone of the film. But when you watch it, you're free to make up your own mind. And and uh, I think that what you see is going to be very, very interesting. Okay. Sorry, Renee. Go ahead. Oh, okay. So I wanted to talk about NDAs. So when everybody's signed these NDAs, what's the worst case scenario? Like if they accidentally say something, what what's the... Uh, percussion for it. I mean, what's the outcome? What can happen? What's the worst case scenario if they break that? Well, you know, the for one thing, most of the people, and I was very angry with the, these people that are holding this information when I first started the movie. It's like, how dare you do that? You, you're sitting with the answers that I desperately need and you're, and you're not going to tell me, you're not going to share them. I don't think that's right. But there's another side to it that I came to understand. And like when 
when somebody signs an NDA, they're making a promise, a pledge to not reveal information. And they're, they're basically swearing an oath. Now that might be right or wrong, but to them, it's about integrity. And then there are huge repercussions, everything from losing your retirement benefits uh, to, to losing your position, whatever that is, losing your security clearance. And on deeper levels, you know, they'll threaten your family. So, you know, it's like, and, and, and people have died over this stuff. So it's, it, you know, there, there's no real upside to defying that and coming out as a whistleblower. At least there wasn't, but we're hoping in the near future that's going to change. But if there's an accidental truth, do they just get a slap on the hand? Like what's, what well, look, look what happened with Robert Bigelow. Um, now I've been told that this is not true. And so this is only my opinion, but when Robert Bigelow, uh, <laughs> yeah, I see, I see that from Simone. Yeah, that, it is. Um, when Robert Bigelow came out on 60 Minutes and said aliens, uh, I think he stepped over a line that got him in a lot of trouble. What people didn't understand at that time, nobody knew that he was involved in ATIP and he was working with Lou Elizondo and Skinwalker Ranch. Nobody knew any of that. Robert Bigelow was just a space guy that was building hotels in space. Um, so when he did that, it wasn't really clear who he was and how much of a position he was in to know but i think after he did it if you look at what happened and i'm told this is unrelated but if you look what happened immediately after bigelow aerospace basically imploded they closed down they laid off all their people supposedly due to covid the his technology was literally cannibalized by a bunch of other aerospace companies um, and NASA actually stiffed him for millions of dollars that he had to sue him for. So I think that, in my opinion, that that might have been the repercussions for, for going too far on 60 Minutes. And so, you know, it's just an example of what can happen. We do have that clip, I think. Here's the outtake. Do you believe that UFOs have come to Earth? There has been and is an existing presence, uh, an ET presence. His unshakable statement regarding the reality of an extraterrestrial presence drew some media reaction. Its significance did not become clear until the story of Bigelow Aerospace and its role in ATIP began to unfold. Confronted with the challenge of weaving Robert Bigelow's informed beliefs into the story Chris Mellon had revealed, Mellon said this, there aren't many people associated with the uh, the establishment who are so bold and uh, willing to make statements like that. He has his own space stations in space. I don't know who else has done that. And he, by the way, he's done it for a long time. So uh, give the guy some credit. He knows what he's talking about. I mean, that's a pretty, I can't believe they put that in a clip. That's a pretty, pretty um, poignant moment in the film because I had specifically asked Lou Elizondo, was like, what about Bigelow saying aliens? And that's when he gave me that answer. Uh, yeah, give the guy some credit. He knows what he's talking about. Um, you know, one thing about accidental truth, nobody is taken out of context. If somebody said something, it was directly related to what they said. I've had people accuse me of kind of juggling people around and, and make him appear to say things that none of that is happening in this film. Every single response is in response to exactly where they're placed and exactly what they said. And I, I feel the integrity of this film is really important to me. And, and I made it and, and I made sure that I made an honest film, but the, uh, it's interesting because I, you know, I confronted Chris Mellon in an interview, uh, and that's an interview that I conducted, and that it's on Zoom. It's not super good looking, but I asked him the hard questions, and one of them was about Bigelow and aliens, and the other one was about, well, Chris, your former Undersecretary of Defense for Intelligence, you're saying that the government's not studying UFOs, and you would know because of your position, but we know better than that. So how do you how do you you know make that work? And in his answer, he literally admitted a program studying crash debris. I mean, it was shocking. And um, it came, it was as close to an admission as possible. And so, you know, that's another accidental truth from the film. I was going to say the one thing they did. All right. They did. We all know that they did come out and say UFOs are real. The actual mechanical craft or the bio, biological mechanical craft. But they never did come out and say that alien life is real. They never have said that. No, so and, and even though Bigelow did, even though Bigelow kind of alluded to that, 
um, no one ever said anything. Yeah, and it's like Chris Mellon says, nobody in our group would be that bold. And they, um, they, 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 they're deliberately avoiding that exact word. And there could be a lot of reasons for it. And in the film, we explore, well, you know, maybe it's not aliens. Maybe it's something else. Uh, you know, I think it's the when you check out all the possibilities, I really think it's all of the above. And we're going to find that there's a lot of different things that are making these things happen. Um, but, yeah, they, it's they haven't gone there and they haven't admitted or or turned out any of this technology. But in the film, we're not leaving them a lot of room to breathe. There's, you know, right. there was a little bit of air between the wall of you're going to have to finally come clean and where these guys are right now. And the purpose of this film is to just suck out that remaining air. You guys are now up against the wall. There's nowhere right. else to go but closer to the truth. So let's get with it. It's kind of like when Michio, Michio Kaku was talking about um, quantum entanglement in regards to uh, multiverses or different dimensions. Now, if, if you think of them, these uh, beings that are piloting or, or running these craft are blinking in and blinking out from multiverses or different dimensional realities, um, that could be one of the reasons why they're not coming out and saying alien, quote unquote, from space, because then that would be from our reality, from our space, Mm -hmm. and not necessarily from where they're actually originating from. And that's where I would go with this, that they're thinking that it could be from anywhere. Well, I'm also thinking that, you know, they know where at least some of this stuff is from. And that's what's really so sad about this is that we're being told this story and we're absorbing it. And what has happened is that um, – They've got all this information that bubbled up after Roswell, and they've got this 50 years of researching, back engineering technology, studying materials, and they're in this position of, well, we can't admit any of, we can't admit how we covered it up. We can't admit how it came about. We have to reinvent this new story about, you know, where this stuff came from. And that's what they're doing. And so, and, and, you know, the public is going to buy it hook, line and sinker because they do, um, but accidental truth is all about saying, hold on a minute. You can't whitewash that stuff away. You guys did this. You found this stuff. You studied this stuff. You kept the secrets uh, for whatever reason. And, and you covered it up for almost 100 years. And so we, we can't just let you reinvent the story. So they have Bigelow Aerospace to the Stars Academy as two ways to bring that that material, that those facts to the forefront. Oh, look, it bubbled up at Bigelow Aerospace. Oh, look, you know, we, we wrote these papers about technology like traversable wormholes and nuclear powered space travel and all this stuff. And that was all just guys from Bigelow. No, they had the, this, this information has been being kicked around in, in classified programs for, for years. And so now they've got to come up with a way that they can bring it out to the public and, um, and that's that's what we're seeing unfold. And and there's a lot of people that don't even want to see that happen. So yeah, it's really rough. And somebody said something about loving Michio Kaku. You'll love him in this film. I don't know if you've seen it yet, but he is fantastic because I I took all of the uh, reports that came out from the Pentagon about all these secret technologies and materials, and I sat down with Dr. Kaku, and I'm like, okay, well, what about this material that's supposed to uh, uh, compress electromagnetic energy? And, and, you know, he'll tell you, well, you know, that's it's possible to do that, but we don't have that technology yet. And, and so he technically analyzes all of this UFO technology in the film. And it's uh, it's it's really great to watch him do it. And he, and he think, wasn't afraid of it. I think I actually have a short clip of him. We have to be open to the possibility that there are other dimensions and shortcuts, perhaps shortcuts between different universes two particles that are quantumly entangled. And if I do something to this one, this one responds. And if you separate those two by a foot, when I do something here, something happens here. But something even more magical happens that when I take these objects and I put them one here and one at the farthest end of the visible universe, that direction, 13.5 billion light years, and I take the other particle and I put it in that direction, 13.5 billion light years away, when I do this, this one responds instantaneously. 
That's almost like the uh, Hopi proverb uh, where they, well, it's actually a belief where the Hopi Indians believe that the universe is connected by strings, like a big spider mm -hmm. web. So if something happens on Earth, like, say, an atomic blast, it is also felt on all the planets in our galaxy. Yeah, and Dr. Kaku is one of the originators of physics string theory. And I, I saw Anna here in the chat room. She just mentioned, you know, physics can't catch up. Uh, it's true. What we're dealing with right now is are things that are only possible if we completely re-examine our knowledge and our perceptions about space and time. And, and so we're being shown doorways to a complete new understanding of our reality through some of these phenomena. And that is going to be a tough pill to swallow for a lot of people, I'm sure. Uh, the one thing I was going to say, stepping back a second to something you said a couple of minutes ago, um, one, of, one of the reasons I believe they're not really coming out with the whole truth is because they're fearing the possibility of being castigated publicly. Well, yeah, I mean, there's going to be accountability. You, you, right. You've basically sequestered one of the biggest uh, secrets, of, you know, one of the biggest pieces of information in human history, and you've right. hidden it away. And there may have been technologies that could have altered the course of our civilization in positive ways. You know, there's a lot of answering to do, and they're not going to, that's why they're coming up with different ways to get this information up, because it's all about culpability. We have some people that maybe have gone as far as to have done something that could be co considered a crime against humanity. If, they, if there was some kind of giant leapfrog in, in energy technology, say, like, uh, like Dr. Greer says, uh, that's, that's not okay that you hid that. I mean, our entire planet is run and we are enslaved under energy. It, it, right. it, 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 whoever has the gas pump has the money and has the power. And, right. and so if there was some way years ago to, to democratize the creation of, of energy, um, it would have changed everything and it would have put a lot of very powerful people out of business. And if that's really part of the motive, which some people think it is, that's, that's pretty sad. Yeah. The petroleum based industry. Yep. I've heard that from Stephen Greer. Yeah. Um, Rhiannon? It just feels like there's just a, a big power struggle. You know, the ones who have the knowledge have the power. And we, the people, are wanting to know, not because we want the power, we just want to know for the sake of, you know, humanity. So what's our purpose? What's our origination? You know, where do we originate from? Who are we? Are we the aliens or not? You know, what's the deal here? But it's just a big power struggle, I feel like, right now. It's the masses against them. To hide I think the we have a right to know. And, you know, I, every one of us that, that is, I'm one of those people who believes that we're spiritual beings having a human experience. And the knowledge of what's going on around us is something that would help me determine the trajectory of my journey. And so it not only deprives our civilization of collective advancement, but it deprives every one of us of the ability to factor in some very important information when we start trying to figure out who we are and why we're here. And so, you know, there's there's that whole personal basis why every one of us is affected by the fact that these people have done this deception. Right. And it's I agree also with that. Uh, medically, look at, you know, med beds. You keep hearing about med beds. When is that going to come out? This is technology that's been around for a long, long time, right? And we still don't have that ability to heal ourselves in that way. Right. Although med beds, I'm afraid when they come out, they're going to be uh, kept for the elite. I don't know. I mean, Stuff tends to bubble down. You know, the way they keep it for the elite is they make it so expensive, nobody can afford it but them. Right. That's my point. Yeah. Um, I'm hoping it will come out because I'm going to use it. <laughs> just go to Walmart and be like, I got to go get at my med bed session at Walmart. <laughs> just walk in and. Yeah. I heard they actually. I heard they actually. <laughs> I heard they actually have something that is a beginning of the med bed technology where you step into a booth. It takes a picture of your physical being, your physical self, and then it runs a scan and it'll tell you what's wrong with you. Uh, it's like a doctor visit without having a doctor. Right. 
Um, and that's supposed to be the beginning of the introduction of the med bed system. That's cool. That should be accessible to everybody, but the, the difference will be, well, here's what's wrong with you, but you probably can't afford to fix it. Right. And then you're um, going to spend the rest of your journey worrying about all the things that's wrong with you. Yeah, that's pretty funny. I actually like the age regression uh, technology that's supposed to go along with that, if that's actual reality. That's something I'd be interested in. <laughs> if you could pick an age, Tim, what would it be? Well, Long they say they can take age. you back. Well, that's not how it works. Supposedly, med metapods are supposed to take you back to your peak physical condition in your lifetime. So wherever you were at a peak physical shape, um, that's what the beds are able to do. So if you're in, they can't go back more than 30 years. So if they were to come back 30 years, then whatever your age is, say, say you're 45, you go back 30, you're 15. I wouldn't go back that far. <laughs> I'd go back to my 30s, maybe. 30s? I think yeah. that would be a good, good age. 30s physically, but mentally you retain your knowledge and your memories. Mm -hmm. I would do that. As long oh, as yeah, my family, cool. as long as my family and friends are along for the ride, because I don't want to be young if all my friends and all my family dies before I do. Well, don't do travel through movie, space Cthulhu? at the speed of light. Right. <laughs> Time dilation. Yeah, I gotcha. Do okay. You remember the movie Cocoon? What was it called? It was Cocoon. Cocoon. Do you remember that movie? Yeah, Cocoon about was a the, good movie. The, yeah, about the ETs and, and they came in, there was these big, huge, like stone eggs that were in the pool and these old people, you know, the elderly, they were swimming in this water and they had all this energy and they literally like regressed back in time and uh, all their friends were old and dying and they just felt so empowered. It was such a good movie. Yeah, of course, that's a story. I wish that was true. But yeah. um, what I want to say is I have a couple other questions for you. Um, okay. Um, have you experienced any media censorship since your movie came out? Um, I don't think so. Um, you know, but now there was some some very interesting attempts to, to in my opinion, to, to sabotage the release. Um, there was, a, you know, Matthew Modine is the narrator of the film. This is an A-list actor. And for some reason, the data that got dropped when they released the film didn't even list him as being in it. And we had to fight like cats and dogs to, to get that corrected. It was ridiculous. And, and, you know, it's like when you get somebody of his caliber, he played Dr. Brenner in Stranger Things and he plays... Uh, he, believe it or not, he plays Van Over Bush in the upcoming Oppenheimer movie, which I just thought was it was just really, really kind of uh, ironic. <laughs> and, and I said, you know, we had breakfast together while we were recording, and I said, you know, Van Over Bush is supposedly a member of MJ12, and he's like, well, I don't know what that is, and so I cued him in um, about what that was all about. And so, yeah, he's playing Van Over Bush in that in that new Oppenheimer film, and so I've got a guy that was a. Uh, a scientist played a, sci a scientist running a secret government program, narrating a movie about sci about people running secret government programs, and then he's playing a member of MJ12 in, the, in his next movie. But cool. the reason I'm bringing that up, one thing, kudos to Matthew, obviously, but the other thing is that the original release didn't even have him in there. It had people that weren't in the film. It had people in the film that weren't listed. None of my headliners, the Michio Kaku wasn't there. Um, uh, Tim Burchett wasn't there. Ralph Blumenthal wasn't there. Dr. Gary Nolan wasn't there. And so basically what they'd done is they'd taken the data from when I first did the deal to make the film. And even though I I told them to change it over and over again, it somehow or another slipped through. And nobody's that dumb. You know, that was, to me, somebody just you know a couple of little knee capping events happened and that's just one example there's been several but the film is getting out there people are watching it and um and and it's not because it's not because there hasn't been opposition right um i do have a clip from uh tim burchett in regards to his feelings concerning um 
um, the in information being uh, kind of like uh, after the first U UAP hearing, everything came to a halt. It was like the door was slammed. And he, it's very he, interesting how that unfolded. And I could tell you some stories about those hearings when we get back from the clip. Okay, here's the, I think, you know, that's not it. This is the one. Here it is. What do you think is happening here? It's bogus. It's a cover up. Um, it's the things that, that, that I can't tell you about that I've seen that would really disturb you. It's a, um, it's a threat to our, um, to our, to our country's safety, the, the airspace. We do not control it. And the and the Pentagon is basically involved in a cover up. That's him coming out and saying that. He also said, he also said one more thing here that I wanted to point out. Um, if there's something in our military air zone that we do not control, that gamut, we better be concerned. And you know, and of course, is it, 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 the question is, is it the Russians? Well, if it's the Russians, you know, Putin's ego. He would land one of the UFOs on the White House lawn and get out bare chested, ride a unicorn up, and punch the president in the mouth and get back on it and fly back. It's the Chinese, same thing. If we had it, we would control the airways. It's it's either one of two things. It's either we have captured something and we were reverse engineering, which some of the, the pilots that I've talked to, Navy pilots think that it is skunk works and, or it is something from outer space. Something from outer space. Yeah. You know, he's in the film talking about this stuff as well. And um, one thing about those hearings, you know, I, I'm, I'm the media relations director for MUFON and they are the mutual UFO uh, network the oldest and largest organization in the world studying the UFO topic. Uh, been around for 55 years, have database of hundreds of thousands of sightings. Recently, we got into the lobbying game and we have been working with A10 and Associates in Washington, D.C. Uh, and it was Jessica Taco, who is the is the lot who owns this company um, and her team that on our behalf have gotten us into over 300 meetings behind closed doors with Senate, uh, with Congress people and their staffs. And we are the ones who got with Andre Carson, uh, Mike Gallagher, Kirsten Gillibrand, and we got Andre to do that hearing. And P people don't know that we have, we haven't really been talking about it, but we were very instrumental in bringing that forth. And I can yeah. tell you myself about three months ago, I actually sat next to Andre Carson for an hour long lunch. And the two of us talked candidly about the UFO topic. And I said, you know, Andre, you're in my movie. You're opening up this thing and you're telling this story that's not really true. And he's like, look, I got to work within certain parameters. Every one of these guys knows that, that, they're, that we're being lied to about this thing. And they're just as frustrated, many of them, as we are. And so even though they're privy to certain classified information that we're not getting, they're very, they still know that they're not getting everything. And so where you get really angry against the government, um, a lot of the, of what we call the government are on our side. They want this information out. Right. Um, um, you had Gary Nolan in your film talking about um, consequences of people in the military coming close to technology that was exotic. Can you explain that? Well, he was tasked because he's a physiology, um, uh, I'm sorry, a pathology professor at Stanford, one of the best. Uh, he was tasked with examining brains of, you know, well, not actual brains, but, um, you know, brain scans, MRIs, et cetera, of people that have a, a variety of people. He had the ones that um, had been subjected to the Havana syndrome, Right. Uh, he, he looked at those. He's looked at, uh, you know, people that have supposedly had close encounters with with these craft where there's, you know, all kinds of different damage that has occurred or supposedly has occurred. And then he had the chance to look at the brains of remote viewers and experiencers. And he made some startling discoveries for sure. Right. He said uh, there were changes in the basal ganglia. And if I'm right, there was something to do with the prudiment and the basal ganglia itself, some type of loss of, uh, I, I'm not sure if it was 
ions. Well, there's two different are. things that, that he found. One is like people that had Havana syndrome that didn't have much to do with the basal ganglia, but he was able to establish that, yes, there is something common among these people. And yes, there is injury. So at that point, he sent the Havana syndrome stuff back to whoever is trying to figure that out because right. because he was done. And I, from what he told me, he didn't really want to be involved in that beyond that. Um, and then he, you know, studying the brains of of these other people that have had injury, there there was the, some of the conclusions also that yes, the, these are injuries that exist. But where the basal ganglia research came in is with remote viewers and experiencers and people with. Uh, ex accentuated mental acuity he found that they they in many cases have an enlarged more developed basal ganglia which is part of the brain and it's traditionally been associated with perception with uh, clairvoyance with intuition and so this is a scientific discovery that lends some validity to the idea that part of our brain in certain people has developed to be able to perceive things that not everybody else can perceive and it's a it's a stunning breakthrough it takes up the last 20 minutes of our film also telepathy correct mm -hmm. yeah okay um here's that clip a significant percentage of the population report having encounters with non-human beings stunning new research by dr gary nolan has revealed a trait in the human brain that may make some people more prone to abilities such as heightened intuition, psychic abilities, and possibly an ability to communicate in undeveloped manners, such as telepathy. We had the MRIs of remote viewers, and this area of their brain lit up like a Christmas tree. The condition has been observed in so-called experiencers. Nolan has detected increased activity and development in a region of the brain called the basal ganglia. Believe it or not, people were finding that it had something to do with intuition. What Dr. Nolan has discovered may represent a leap in human evolution, or even a new variation of Homo sapien. That's just to back up what you said, Ron. Um, and you said it succinctly. Um, what I'd like to ask you about are the alien time travelers theory. Yeah, you know, uh, I asked Dr. Kaku about that. He's not a big fan of time travel, but the you know he he basically says, well, yeah, it might be possible, but you're gonna you're gonna have to show me some proof. Now, some people say there's a there's a guy out there, Dr. Michael Masters, who actually says that these that he believes that uh, some of the extraterrestrials are actually time travelers coming from a future, uh, so you can't rule it out. Um, uh, there, there's a lot of things that we bring up in the movie. You can't rule it out. It's um, it, 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 uh, interdimensional beings, uh, creatures that have been here, ultra terrestrials. They're, they're actually here. They're in the earth. They're under the ocean. Uh, aliens, flesh and blood aliens from other planets um, and, you know, all kinds of other things like Lou Elizondo says in the film. We, what's our definition of life? And, and wow, I said it just like him. <laughs> you could tell I yeah, watched it did. a lot. You did. <laughs> That's bad. Um, <laughs> but um, yeah, so what we're going to learn as we learn more and more about what this stuff is, is just as much about the nature of reality and the nature of our existence than rather or not they're little green men from another planet. It, the, the, the mystery that is being paraded before us and, and we're being invited to unravel it is going to show us things far beyond anything we could possibly imagine. Right. Even Lou said that. He said it's far greater than just alien life or ships flying in our airspace. It's much more than that. And it's so incomprehensible for some people in Congress even that it's hard for them to wrap their heads around it thus having difficulty to bring it out to the public. Yeah, absolutely. And um, it's just a fun time to be involved in this stuff. You know, as, as I was making the film, especially getting toward the end when, when, I, when I chose to end it the way I did, it's like, wow, man, you know, this is, I started off this angry dude that was pissed off because of all these secrets being kept from us. And I finished walking out like a wide-eyed kid going, oh, man, what is next? I cannot wait. And and hopefully the viewers have that same experience. I actually heard that now that uh, Congress 
or not Congress, but the AARO organization has been ordered to research all the way back to 1947 or even before to cover now this, some you know, of I'll that. I'll tell you. So, so yeah, this is interesting. The, the legislation basically orders the military to come forward with any records they have regarding UFO stuff going back to 1945. The original legislation said 1947. Um, MUFON, again, was behind the scenes. We worked with the authors of this bill, and we got that time set back to 1945. And the reason we were able to do it is because we didn't want to bookend Roswell, and there's a couple other things that happened right before Roswell. So once again, MUFON lobbying in Washington, D.C., we got that done. And, and that's one of the things that we're the proudest of is that we were able to influence this legislation that got passed. And with the whistleblower protection, with the military mandatory release of information, um, yeah, we've been busy <laughs> and, and, and we have the success to show for it. I actually do have a short clip about 1945. So history has recorded the first big UFO sighting in the United States is 1947 in Roswell, New Mexico, very famously right outside Roswell. But actually, there was, in some sense, a bigger and more significant event sighting two years before, also in New Mexico, at exactly the moment the U.S. government was detonating the first atomic weapon, shortly thereafter used in Japan. And witnesses on the ground saw some kind of object, shaped like an avocado, they said, crash land. It was inspected by a lot of locals. There were beings inside, they said, and it was carted away by the U.S. government. Yeah, so that's that's one of the reasons we were able to get this pushed back because it didn't start with Roswell in 1947. I mean, it, it's been historically present for all of recorded history, but as far as right. the U.S. military, it, it didn't start even in 1945. It's been going on for a long time, but at least we were able to get around that year because if it, if it went to 47, then they'd fudge 47, and if they can fudge 47, then they can fudge Roswell, and so... By, by just getting that two-year extension pushback on the, on the legislation, which we, which we did, um, we've changed the whole way that that's going to play out. Uh, Project Mogul was kind of a <laughs> tacky way of explaining Roswell. I mean, there's just too much evidence to prove otherwise. I think and that that whole uh, U.S. Air Force final report on Roswell was basically an acknowledgement that all the stories are true because the story that they actually said was so insulting to anybody with any intelligence that it, it's, it, to me, it's a confession. It's, it, it's as close to a confession as we're ever going to get. We have crash test dummies that must have fallen through time to end up where they ended up. You know, we have all this different technology that wasn't even happening at the same time. So these stories are like, yeah. So yeah, it's, um, I, I thought that Roswell final verdict or, what was it called the final report or oh roswell case closed i think that was just you know they were just acknowledging it to anybody that wanted to read between the lines right because it was um, so preposterous uh you know, rihanna like, go ahead rihanna i have a question for ron okay have you had any experiences yourself you know it's interesting i think that the universe has ordained me to be a journalist from an objective standpoint. And if I was an experiencer or if I'd seen a lot of this stuff myself, I wouldn't be objective anymore. And so for that reason, I, I really don't. I don't have, I've done, you know, I've done some ghost documentaries and ghost hunting and life after death stuff. I've seen some weird things. And I can, I've seen some things in the sky that I can't explain, but they don't go to the point of, you know, oh gosh, I saw a UFO, it changed my life. I just, I have not had that experience. Um, so for whatever reason, and I believe there's a cosmic reason for it, I think I'm here to do a job and I couldn't do that job if I was, if, if my perceptions were colored by the, you know, the, the radical change that some of these experiences force. Like right. you're an outsider looking in and just diving in as a researcher. Yeah. And I want to be able to, to have a, you know, critical thinking. I don't want my impressions colored by anything. I don't want to sign off on something I can't prove. And MUFON is dedicated to the scientific understanding of the UFO phenomenon for the benefit of humanity. And that's one of the reasons that I aligned with them, uh, you know, despite ups and downs over the years. They, they are the people that are doing this work from that point of view. And so I'm happy to be affiliated. And um, 
I, you know, I don't want to make a UFO documentary that comes from somebody that's that's like Travis Walton. I helped produce his movie. You know, I, I wouldn't want to be Travis. I could, <laughs> and he'll tell you, it's like you think it's great, you should have been there. Um, I couldn't make the kind of films I make and present the information I present if my reality was colored by something like what happened to him. Um, my other my other co-host is Tom Reed, who is uh, associated with the um, uh, Reed family uh, UFO incident in Sheffield, Mass. And um, oh, yeah. I have I have to tell you, uh, I think it, it was called the Berkshires UFO incident. Yeah, I know uh, Tom. Unjustly, yeah. Tom and I are are friends, and he's my How come co-host. He's not here? Um, he's um, rebuilding his kitchen, I think. Oh, okay. Well, hey, um, cooking and, is far more important than talking to me. Right, and he is getting ready to uh, take a trip to North Carolina for UFO Expo, his baby of a convention in North Carolina with Rhiannon and Allie and others on June 10th. Oh, that's so, awesome. um, well, shout out to Tom Reed. I, I, I worked with him at the last MUFON uh, conference and um, he was, he was really fun to work with. I, I'm sure that he would be glad to hear from you. I will pass that along. Um, I'm sure he was also upset that he couldn't talk to you. So oh, uh, yeah. I know that we'll want to have you back on the channel at some date uh, soon so that Tom can be there to also t talk to you as well. I'm yeah, up for well, an interview you anytime. And, and, you know, the, uh, Things are unfolding so fast, and we we really are in the thick of it. We want to work with all the One one thing I want to bring up: um, What do you think of James Fox? And his I have stuff? known James for years. The the night that the phenomenon came out, he was actually at my house. We did an interview um, about the about the movie, and we talked about you know how hard it is to be a filmmaker and make money these days, and, and be able to support yourself and have enough money to make your next film. He did an amazing job with the phenomenon. He gave Accidental Truth a shout out on Joe Rogan, and then he called me the next morning and he said, "Dude, your movie's number two. And and so I have a great relationship with James Fox. I think very highly of him. Okay, there's awesome. one thing I, one thing I want to play from James Fox that is in reference to everybody questioning whether um, UFOs are part of a foreign adversarial technology. Here it is. Well, I actually went to Russia and I went to China and I spoke with generals in both of those places. And they're like, yeah, it's not us. <laughs> there's clearly objects of unknown origin that are whizzing around with impunity. They exhibit a technology that is far beyond anything that we have. So there you got James Fox saying that. Yeah, and you know, in the film, James Fox has a couple lines in my appearance, and he appears a couple times in my movie. Um, one of the things that's very interesting is John Alexander, who's in the film. A lot of people know who he is, but they don't really know who he is. Uh, this is the guy that was out there front and center in the UFO community for years saying, oh, there's no programs. And it, then he's finally come out in, in Accidental Truth. He admits that he was running one of these programs at the top secret level. And, um, you know, I joke around that John's the John is the real deal guy that could tell you, but he'd have to kill you. Um, <laughs> he, he really was involved in all this stuff going all the way back. And he admits in the film that the same characteristics that we're seeing uh, in the current uh, story about the, these craft 30, 40 years ago, they were seeing the exact same thing. And going all the way back to Sanford, they were seeing the exact same thing. So this technology when people say, well, it must be ours. Uh, well, it wasn't ours 40 years ago and it wasn't ours a hundred years ago, but it was showing the same kind of capabilities. And, it, you know, one of the things that, that very few people uh, bring up in these interviews with me is the absolute importance of the things that John Alexander reveals in this film. Uh, it's just amazing what he finally comes out and admits. Uh, so yeah, it's another, uh, one of the things that I want to bring up is the fact that we do not have transmedium uh, capabilities with any sort of craft in our arsenal at all. Uh, I've seen patents for um, advanced technologies that haven't been really made public, but 
then again, what is a patent other than a number? Mm -hmm. Well, you know, there's a whole section in the film that got cut out of addressing that patent issue. Um, the scientist, I'm, I'm going to butcher his pronunciation of his name, but it's like Salvatore Pius that that uh, patented a bunch of things and the, the uh, a craft using inertial dampening technology, you know, things that basically, because these things can't go from space to air to water as a physical object without having some kind of a field that is minimizing what's going to happen, if, you know, when you hit that. So there's got to be something energetic that's being admitted that enables them to do that. That kind of cancels out gravity and even physical force. It's the only explanation. Um, unless they're like, you know, kind of changing the channel on, on the frequencies of reality that enables them. But it's still the same thing. It's a field, uh, quite likely. So he's patented these things. The patent office turned down the patents. They, they said, no, this is preposterous. This technology doesn't exist. And, and these patents make no sense. Then the Secretary of the Navy writes the patent office and says, no, you need to grant these patents. We believe this technology is already in development by us and others. And, and so, the, so they granted the patents. But then I interviewed Dr. Kaku about the patents. And he said, this is high school physics. These things are, this stuff is complete nonsense. And the one place that, that Salvador Pius has gone on to, uh, to talk about these is the Theory of Everything uh, show with, with I, I'm not even going to try to pronounce his last name. It's Kurt. And he's a, he's a scientifically trained guy doing a podcast. And he says, no, there's this thing called the pious principle, and this is how it works. But basically he's saying these things are feasible by my patents, but you're going to have to completely redefine the laws of physics and make a whole bunch of new discoveries in order right. for this stuff to work. And so, right. you know, that's, that's interesting. I'm thinking that they saw this stuff. Oh, wow, look what these ships are doing. And Salvatore sat down and said, well, how could they possibly do that? And he came up with some great ideas and some theories, and then he patented the, the, the ideas, and then he got some help from the Navy. So right. there you go. We do have a surprise uh, appearance of Tom Reed. So I'm going to bring him up on the panel. All right. See if he's, oh, he left his chair, but he's coming. <laughs> hey. There, there he is. is. Hey, Tom. hey, Ron. How you doing, hey, buddy? I thought, I thought you didn't want to talk to me. No, nothing personal. It's actually Tim <laughs> I didn't want to talk to. <laughs> oh, figures. <laughs> no, I've been talking to him for an hour. I get yeah, it. All right. Yeah. <laughs> no, he's a great guy, man. I just had a million things going on. I got to go to, I got hit like five states in like six weeks, and the car's not done. I'm working on PowerPoint. Oh, wow. My kitchen's a mess, and I'm just trying to get everything done. So, um, but anyway, uh, yeah, it was good seeing you. And uh, what was it? Um, uh, oh, were we Boulder? No. Um, frick, where were we, man? Um, at a MUFON conference. Yeah. Um, wh what's what Colorado? state was that? It was Colorado, right? Oh yeah, the last one. Yeah. yeah. And, and yeah. you and me, we were we were having some scheduling uh, questions about Congressman Tim Burchett chiming in. He was going to Skype and, um, in or zoom into my talk. Yeah, time. yeah. And so we worked together to get that handled, and um, and I think I dropped uh, I dropped Tim a. a call out for you and um it was great great worker with you are you going to be in uh cincinnati for the move on no no i'm not no? no i'm going to new york to do pine bush um okay. i'm going to be at my park uh with you know rita king the daughter of bb king and steve ray oh, Vaughan. that's awesome they've got a bench going in so we're going to film for that for a new film that's uh, being done on my family called the bridge very cool. um so the, and then uh then i'll be in north carolina um, you, ma'am, you could probably zoom into that talk in North Carolina. Yeah, I'd be happy June to 10th. do it if it's if I'm available. The um, June. 10th. I mean, I love doing these things. Yeah, we're going to be at Contact in the Desert. They're showing the film as a special event. Nice. So I'm actually going to be in the room. I, I've been in the room with with audiences twice. We sold out the Sedona Film Fest, Festival Theater for the red carpet, but it, it it I'm terrified when I sit in a room full of people watching this film. You know, but usually it's gratifying because nobody gets up and leaves nobody uh that's a good sign you know, they stay for the q a and um yeah so but but it doesn't take away that kind of little bit of fear that you have of like getting on stage and talking and performing music and oh, when like, you're on, sitting yeah. in a room while people are watching your movie that's like oh yeah well, nobody's throwing yeah. tomatoes at you no not not yet <laughs> only in some circles yeah if i'm not mistaken you're like six foot four Right? Six two. 
six two. I was like talking. I was in the. Uh, I'm talking to him like so. Yeah, so yeah, ten. Can- <laughs> like the next level. Um, I like have to five, say, five. Ron, yeah. you're short compared to me. I'm six eight. So really, yes. Wow. Dude, I'm making the Bigfoot movie, man. I'm going to put you in a Chewbacca costume and make you run through the woods. Oh, no. No, thank you. I don't want to get shot. We'll be part of that. I'll be running from you. Oh, that'll work. I'll do it. I'll be chasing Rihanna. Yeah, I'll do it. (laughs) Anyways. um, Hold on. I think I see a show. Somebody call the History Channel. Naked and Afraid and Bigfoot. You know? Yeah, there Um, you go. Yeah. So, uh, well, it's good. Anyway, uh, yeah. I did. I did. I did talk about you a little while ago, Tom. I uh, said yeah. you were busy working on your house and getting ready to go to North Carolina and yeah. Yeah. UFO Expo, which is coming up, and uh-huh. uh, uh, that you're goofing around, and that's why you didn't come tonight. Yeah. Well, uh, I'm getting older and hurt my back and ankles, and I'm sore and. Thank God for Tylenol and rum. So, yeah, right. I don't think you're supposed to take those together. Something about <laughs> yeah, that's, yeah, liver that's destruction. Working, <laughs> yeah, so I'm all hey, right. T- Tom, it's okay if the answer is no, but did you see the movie? No. Okay. Well, check it out. I, I can't wait to hear what you think about it. Your, life, yes. your opinion is, is one that matters. How, where is it running? Where can I see it? It's Amazon all over the Prime. rental places. Yeah, yeah. It's like you can get it on Amazon and all that. I think it's as low as three ninety nine for the SD version. So wow. nobody's going to okay. go broke watching it. Tom, well, can you send me a notes. signed copy, and I will definitely uh, watch it in the meantime. And yeah, I mean, it's not out on DVD. Um, it's only oh, on okay. platforms not... right now. But when it does come out on DVD, I, I think I still have the DVD rights, but I don't want to put them out because as soon as as soon as you do that, it's it, it, somebody rips the DVD and puts it up on YouTube. Well, got a, yeah, it's a whole new fight. So, so we got. I know I, I don't want to <laughs> screw up the flow of what you guys are talking about. Too late. But um, we're gonna be. <laughs> but uh, in uh, North Carolina, um, if you wanted to zoom into that, we'd love to have you come in, and we maybe we could just uh, have you talk to the room for a little bit. It's sure. uh, June June tenth. Uh, Rihanna and I are running that. It's it's part of UFO Expo. And uh, we, Rihanna, you can get in touch with them later and let them know what's going on with that. Um, and I just think it would be nice to have you there. And then we're Let also, me add it to the calendar right now. So what, yeah. about what time would you right. want to do it? Beautiful. All right. What time think, do you want to do it? This is me. I'm really adding this to my calendar so Good. I can be there. Because we really, we're really adding you to the show. <laughs> so... <laughs> Now the audience knows what goes on behind. Yeah, the we'll we'll make us it'll be like our surprise guest, you know. Oh, that'll be and, fine. Yeah, Ron, I'll have to tell you what time. I'll have to look at this. Okay, schedule. you've got my contact info. I added it to the yeah. calendar for like six p.m., but it can change. Thanks let's for your go, patience, Tim. I appreciate let, you. Yeah, working. not a problem. Let's okay. go around the panel and uh, make some last comments, uh, Rihanna. Oh, last can you moment. hear me? Okay, so yeah. Yeah, I can hear you. <laughs> yeah. So, Ron, what is the next? What are you going to do next? Wow. What is next after this? Believe it or not, I'm working on a reality show about music. Um, and I'm, I think my next film is going to be a near death experience, life after death, ghost hunting, all combined into one film with uh, quantum physics about consciousness. I'm, I'm chilling on UFOs for a minute. I do. I do my shows for MUFON Television, so I, you know, you'll see me there. But I'm not going to make another UFO documentary for a little while. I mean, to me, accidental truth is a period at the end of the sentence. In a lot of ways, uh, it brings us right up to this moment in the field. It tells the story in a self-contained way, and it presents evidence and and a, a, a thought experiment for the audience that you will not get anywhere else in a film like this. Um, so, you know, how do I top it? I, I'm not sure I can. And I'm not like tooting my own horn because I think I made a great film. I'm I'm just saying that a lot of people are telling me that what I set out to do, I did accomplish. And that just makes me feel really good. And so, you know, I'm not egoed out about it, but I don't have too much more to say about the UFO thing right now besides what I said in the film. Okay. So the project or the uh, Bigfoot, when do you think that's going to come out? That's interesting. I was kind of joking about that, but I'm doing, I'm doing a pilot for, we're shooting three episodes of of a new show called other highways and i'm doing like this anthony bourdain meets the paranormal thing and we are going to do oh, some wow. bigfoot reenactments um That's but i was kidding cool. about 
getting Tim. I'm, I'm, I, he didn't sound like he wants to do it. But well, you know, if Rihanna, if I have to chase Rihanna through the woods, I will definitely do it. I don't think Bigfoots do that, do they? Start they, they chase out. women around the fast. woods. <laughs> I got wheels. <laughs> That's pretty funny. Anyways, um, Tom. Um, yeah, so I just wanted to say, uh, Ron, it was really good to see you again. I'm sorry I couldn't be here for the earlier part of it, but um, uh, it's okay. It good to talk with you again, and and uh, yeah, we'll have to get do something in the future. And uh, Th thanks you know, for having and again, me. Again, you know, we are, uh, you know, we are working on a, on a project right now. Maybe we we could get you involved in that too. Yeah. yeah well, you know, I have a full blown production company, and and I tend to. Um, not really uh, like be trying to get rich off people anymore. Like in the, in the day when you got to fight in Hollywood and then every, you know, Oh, wow, that's $125 an hour. Really? I mean, to plug in yeah. a cable to a wall, it's terrible. <laughs> so somebody, Mr. DB Cooper says, I wish it was nonfiction. Um, you should watch the film, dude. It is. Um, Alex, it is nonfiction. <laughs> I know who DB Cooper is. He's a big supporter of UFO man channel. And, um, I want to thank him for being here as well. And the fact is, is D, uh, Alex, it is a factual movie. So uh, take a watch and get back to me later in comments. Yeah, take a look at the film and, and send me your comments. I'm I'm pretty accessible out there. You can reach me through MUFON Television or pretty much anywhere. I'd, I'd be, you know, when people are skeptical and they think, oh, it's the same old information being recycled, or they say some of the things that they say that make it very clear to me that they haven't watched the film, I'm, I'm always open to hear what people really think. But, but the one thing that's discouraging is people thinking they know what they're talking about when they haven't seen it. I want to watch it tonight. Yeah, I've I've watched it twice, and like I told you before the show, I seem to get more knowledge from it, or little tidbits I missed the first time, the second time around. And you suggested that I should watch it maybe three or four times, and maybe then I'll get the real perspective of what it's all about. So I'm gonna do that. There's onion. The the, the films like an onion. You know, there's different layers to it. Uh, I'm not out there saying, oh, you should watch it four times to people because right. most people no. won't. And then they'll be like, why should I have to watch it four times if it's good? Once would do. But there are a lot of things going on uh, on many right. different levels through the film. And um, right. and, and thank you, D.B. Cooper. I was, I was kidding around with you. But uh, yeah, I'd love to hear what you think of it. <laughs> yeah. Okay. Yeah. Okay. So we want to thank everybody who watched online. And we want to thank, thank everybody you. who participated in the chat room as well. And from all of us on the panel, we want to say good night, and we'll see you next week.